Hello and welcome to Trading Blues from TraderX. A busy show this week as uh, myself and the panel discuss the ongoing banking shenanigans, what's going on with US regional banks and of course UBS's shotgun marriage over the weekend to Credit Suisse. We also dig into the macroeconomic impact of all of that, how traders can adjust to the higher vol regime that we're now seeing as we go on a bit of a roller coaster ride across markets. And we also have a look at the BOE decision after a very, very worrying inflation number how do we think BOE are likely to react to that? Without further ado, let's get into the show. So let's meet our panellists. Uh, as always, going head to head over four rounds, they will score points for a great answer. They will have the threat of points being chalked off if a dispute is raised over their answer. Uh, and of course, the arbiter of the points is myself. The more, uh, sorry, the better their response, the more points they will score. You can tell I've been awake since 4 a.m. Uh, joining me on the panel this week, Richard Matthews, the founder, stroke managing director of Pardus FX, a specialist FX provider for corporate, institutional, and high net worth clients. Uh, from down in South Africa, on Venta, a market analyst with Financial Source, and uh, a new guest on the panel this week, Ewan Smith, a uh, veteran of financial markets, well over 20 years experience in tier one banks and running his own research firm. And he's even brought along a pair of brown shoes in the background just for me this week. Uh, we've got a good panel and we've got a busy show. So uh, let's get into round one. Well, there's really only one place we can start this week, and that is with the banks. Of course, UBS, I don't think it was their choice. They were sort of forced to buy Credit Suisse over the weekend, and it appears to have calmed a few nerves in uh, Europe, at the very least. We've seen uh, bank stocks rally, uh, fixed income. Uh, we've seen bond yields move higher. CDSs have, have come in a little bit. So what I really want to get into is, you know, can we all now put our feet up? breathe a bit of a sigh of relief, say that this is over? Or do we think that there could be worse to come? Is this kind of the canary in the coal mine that flags bigger trouble for the banking sector in Europe? And of course, the US banking sector facing its own issues as well. Um, you and it's your first time on the show. So let's start with you. Uh, yeah, um, this is quite interesting. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting how we keep sort of coming around every cycle where we're, we're having these problems with, you know, with banks. I mean, the focus back on, you know, potential credit risk at, at banks, especially the biggest banks in Europe. I mean, it's, you know, it's a monumental shift from what we've been, you know, talking about and discussing for, uh, over recent years. I mean, in theory, um, you know, all the regulations, you know, that, that, that prompted them to cut costs uh, and reduce risk taking should probably have made them better equipped to, to meet all their their obligations so you know what what's happened to to credit Suisse in that regard is that a failure of um regulatory oversight or is that um you know something that the you know the authorities themselves um lack the the capability to to look at you know where all these risks are um for the time being it's obviously assuaged any any fears that, that of extended contagion but i guess we're, we're going to find out a bit further down the line um there's probably going to be a lot of um skeletons coming out of credit swiss's uh, closet but whether that's the the peak i mean it remains to be seen but you know i guess everybody's now everybody's now heightened um expectations of you know, some sort of response should any headline risk uh, evolve and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, exactly that. I think it's just put the banking sector sort of front and centre on everyone's radar. Um, Dick, what are your thoughts on all of this? I guess, I mean, it's not really a surprise that Credit Suisse have gone to the wall, is it? They've been a bit of a basket case for a decade or so now. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely right. Um, I think that the states have now controlled the problems that they've got. I suspect that you'll see other banks come into, into problems, but I think the Fed and the Allen have acted pretty quickly to, to sort everyone's fears. Um, obviously, you know, if you can go and invest in T-bills and, and get nigh on 5%, why wouldn't, why do you leave your money in a bank? Um, I think they have a fundamental problem. They've probably got to, loads of 10-year treasuries on their books which are underwater, if they come in to sell them, they make the massive problems worse. So 
I think you'll see more problems in the States, but I think there'll be controlled problems. UBS and Credit Suisse, I hopefully that solves that. The UK, I think, is pretty solid and, and um, the banks are, are, are sound over here. My worry is, is in Europe, as always in Europe. Uh, <coughs> I suspect that there's some of the southern banks are looking nervously over their shoulder and hoping for a bit of intervention from the ECB, a bit of help there. But what really concerns me, we've had a canary in the coal mine here with the LDI problem back in September, October last year. You've had the problems in the States, you've had problems in Switzerland, but nothing in Europe. And what's going to be the cause of it? Is it going to be derivatives? If you look at the size of the exposure that someone like Deutsche's got, I mean, it's trillions, just unbelievable numbers. And I was a derivatives broker back in the <coughs> early 90s. Oh, well, you've never mentioned it. I've never mentioned that at all. And I'm convinced that no one really understood exposure to derivatives, and, and I suspect they don't now. So my thing I'd be watching would be derivatives uh, and Deutsche Bank and some of the Southern Europeans. So I think it's gone away, but not for good. Yeah, I mean, of course, you and I did a, well, it turned out to be a rather well-timed interview, didn't it, with uh, Blake Morrow the day before all of the concerns around Credit Suisse came up and their shares fell 40%, where you made that a very similar call, saying that European banks haven't yet experienced any issues. And, uh, of course, the very next day we, we saw that come through. Um, Arno, I want to bring you into the show and, and really look at the market impact of everything that's going on. We've had a lot of headlines around financial stability risk. Of course, uh, central banks and, and governments have stepped in relatively quickly to uh, try and control what's going on. But by and large, I would say, you know, equity bears have had pretty much manna from heaven in terms of the news flow over the last couple of weeks. But the S&P 500 is back above 4,000 and above its 50-day moving average for the first time since the very start of the month. Um, are we out of the woods and is risk just going to keep heading higher now? Look, firstly, let me say I'm not a bank expert, you know, so the uh, the normal pinch of salt will be will be a, a good idea. Um I don't think we can ever say that we, we're out of the hoods, uh, woods when it comes to financial markets. There's always going to be some sort of curveball that, that comes our way. Uh, when it comes to the current situation, I, I mean, there's been so much research done and, and notes posted about why this isn't a 2008 scenario. And I'm not going to go through all of those reasons now. I think I'm sure all of us has read through it over the past few days. But I think for me, the biggest difference with, with how the markets reacted this time and, 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 and what's transpired between something like now and 2008 is back in 2008, the Fed didn't really have a lot of practice when it comes to crises, right? We, we had between then and now, we had the global financial crisis. We had uh, the European debt crisis. We had the COVID crisis. And if you take a look at what they did in COVID, I think that showed us that they of the, Every time they get quicker and quicker, faster and faster to react to these types of crises before it becomes, you know, this massive thing, they step in and they save the day. And I don't think this time has been much different. What's been surprising, though, is the, the mild response we've had from the likes of the Fed, right? We, we only had the new funding program announced. We had the, uh, the daily swap lines um, coming into play over the weekend. For me, the fact that they haven't done more means that either they don't see this as uh, you know, either there isn't a big underlying problem or there is one they don't see it. For me, I think that they're looking at all the information that they have. They're looking at this saying that, you know what, we think this is a contained situation. And I think that's what the markets are taking away from this. And I think that's why risk is, has basically, um, you know, outperformed over the past week or so. I think it's really a case of a lack of bad news and no further fears. You know, the, the first thing that everybody said when all of this happened is, oh, you know, Lehman 2.0, Lehman 2.0, 2008, 2008. I think the difference here is that if the Fed really thought this was that moment, they would have done a lot more by now. Why wouldn't they? You know, why wouldn't they step in and just cut rates immediately? You know, if, if, if there's so many trillions underwater in treasuries and you can solve that problem and it's an, a you know, systemic problem, if you can solve that by just cutting rates 200 basis points, they would have done that. The fact that they didn't, I think, shows that they think it's contained. And for me, you know, obviously, we, we're tracking additional news on the banking front, waiting to see whether there's new banks that fail, etc. But the thing I'm most watching now is just how central banks and the Treasury react. If there is going to be another failure, will we get something like a 
blanket uh, insurance on deposits. If that happens, that can calm the nerves. I think at this stage, the Fed and other central banks will do what they can to stop a crisis, you know, before it gets to, you know, a, a 2008 scenario. Arno, oh, no. can I just come in? How, how can the Fed cut rates when inflation is the level it is in the States? They're just not going to do it. That's just an absolute fantasy to me. So I'm being pointed no, at. No, I was going to say, I'm but, just going to say, hold that thought, Dick, because I'm going to move on to the next round because that is exactly what I wanted to get into and we can come right. to you first, mate. Right, now that Mr. Matthews has been put firmly back into his place, we can do the show in the correct order and we can look at the macro impact of what's happened recently. Um, Dick, I'm not even going to read out what I was going to say because I think you almost second guessed my question. Um, inflation is far too high, not just in the US, but, but obviously in the UK as well. We'll get on to the, the Bank of England a little bit later on. What do you think the combination of elevated financial stability risks and an economy that is continuing to, uh, well, confound expectations in terms of growth, but with price pressures too intense. What on earth do central banks do about all of that? Well, they're stuck firmly between the devil and the deep blue sea. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully it turns out that Jay Powell's a very, very good pilot and, and gets us you know, through the rocks. I think they've got a real problem because they can't cut rates. Inflation still is too high. Uh, I do wonder what they're doing, whether that is QE by another name, but certainly reversing some QT, uh, using as many acronyms as I can. <laughs> uh, I, I just think they've got a problem. I think they've got to tough it out. They've got to make the decision between themselves. Do we let inflation rip uh, or, or do we suffer the consequences of, of um, banks going under? I suspect mm. that they will do everything they can to support the banks. And I do think actually whatever they do is inflationary. Counted by the fact that if you lose a bank, that does put a bit of a cap on on top of uh, the economy. Uh, but I think I think they've got a major problem, uh, not nearly as big a problem as as the UK faces. Um, <laughs> I don't think they really know what to do. Previously, you had inflation out of control, right? That's easy to be able to do. We have a banking crisis; we know what to do. It's when you get the two together that gives them the big problem. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I thought it was interesting last week, actually, Christine Lagarde um, at the ECB. Yes, unfortunately, I did have to sit through that press conference um, saying how she didn't see a trade off between financial stability and getting inflation under control, which was interesting language, I, I thought. Um, I've seen that Mr. Greenspan has been turned upside down there. Um, Ewan, is Powell Volcker or is it more of a Greenspan Fed put coming back into the market moment? I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, like you referred to uh, Lagarde there. I mean, like, especially raising rates last week. I mean, is is that her trichet two thousand and eight moment? I, I mean, you know, we keep talking about history repeating itself, but it's. I mean, that in itself is is quite interesting. Um, you know, again, it's it's time will tell. I think. I mean, if we go back to the Fed, obviously this afternoon, um, the the issue they have, obviously, whether the They've adjusted their inflation higher for, for that 2017 to 2022 period. So they were already behind the curve when it came, when it came to inflation anyway. The same as the Bank of England. You know, it always seems as if they're behind the curve. Um, and it's, you know, rates were so long for such a long time. It just feels that they've raced to try and get as high as they can so that they can pause, reassess the situation, and then come back down as as the you know and adjust as according to any any economic impact. Now we know that you know traditional wisdom says that you know it takes nine to twelve months for you know for interest rates to start to influence inf inflation. Um, so again, we're looking at you know at this morning's CPI number in the UK, and it's hotter than everybody expects, but. What we now, so if we're on, so tomorrow, if, if we get that 25 basis points, which looks likely that we will, then that was like, is the 11th in this? I think right? it will be. Yeah, I think it will be from the BOE. Um, you know, and then, you know, three month Sonia rates, uh, you know, they, they're sort of topped out and they're actually towards the end of this year, we're, we're looking at, you know, perhaps even, even cuts. Um, and I tend to look at the University of Michigan uh, one year forward rate in, in the US as well. And that's come back down below 
four percent. So I, I don't. We have to see if it, you know if if this has already started to feed through the system or this series of rate hikes. Um, but again, I'm watching all these indicators, and then hopefully, you know, we we will start to see a top on inflation, and then and then we'll we'll reassess from there. But it's interesting how. So some of the, the leading indicators, especially on the inflation front, have started to, uh, to to top out and perhaps roll over a little. Yeah, most definitely. Arno, what, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, that line from Lagarde, do you take that at face value or do you think she's just saying that because she has to and actually central banks behind closed doors and behind the Hermes scarf are a lot more worried about what's going on? Look, I think they will they will say whatever they have to. Um, firstly, you know, to try and calm nerves. So I think she, she 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 had to say that. You know, what what else would she would she have said to to calm the nerves down? Well, um, you say that. I mean, we've had plenty of faux pas in the past with the not here to close spreads and all that other nonsense. So true. I mean, <laughs> no guarantee around her saying that one. Communication hasn't been her strong suit, that's for sure. <laughs> so she, there's there's many worse things she could have said. I think. Um, but right now, again, you know, I think it's a, it's about the actions they do. What they say, you know, they can say many things, but what what are they actually doing about the situation? That's the most important thing. You know, again, with the Fed stepping in front of, um, you know, in front of the markets, really, with uh, with regards to the funding program, with regards to the um, uh, the uh, the swap lines. I think at this stage, we need to watch what they do and not watch what they say, because again, they will say whatever they need to. Um, again, that comes back to the to the FDIC. In terms of, you know, will we get some sort of a blanket insurance for depositors? All of those types of things, you can say many things, but they have to actually do something to, to make it matter. What I think about this from a, from a macro perspective, though, is that at the bare minimum, I think we can all agree that what this has done, even if it doesn't, you know, um, even if it puts them in a difficult situation to, to link up with what you said, is that in this situation, if we see contagion fears leading to, let's say, tougher lending standards and less appetite for credit creation. Or if you see, like uh, Dick said, you know, a lot of deposits going out of the banks, running into money markets, that obviously leaves a lot less funds available for credit creation. At the bare minimum, this creates a situation where you see a lot of credit drying up. And, you know, as a bare minimum, that should see inflation actually pushing lower. So as long as they can keep things, you know, on an even keel for as long as possible, this situation should, as a bare minimum, see credit growth coming down, which should actually be good for inflation coming down as well. No, I think you're absolutely right on that one. Um, just before we do move on to the next round, I think I've, I've asked this question on the show before. I'm, I'm not sure whether any of you were, were here, but I'm going to ask it again, just in light of what's happened recently, and, and we'll get one by one. Dick, we'll start with you. Who do you think will be the first central bank to cut rates? And if you can get give us a rough idea of when as well, you, you may get a bonus point. Uh, I'll reverse that question. I don't think you'll see a cut this year. Uh, okay. And I think probably first quarter next year and ECB. ECB. Arno? I'm going to go BOC. Um they're under a lot of pressure right now. Um, you know, if, if, if inflation can come down fast enough, maybe we won't. But their consumers is, is, is in trouble. Um, the housing market is looking very shaky. I think if anyone is going to cut, the, the quickest one will probably be the BOC. Um, they were also the quickest one to pause in the current cycle as well. You know? So um, I think they're a little bit ahead when it comes to that. Um, if we do get one, it's, it's probably going to be closer to quarter three. Um, but, you know, Let's see how inflation fares first, but my bet would be on the BOC. Good stuff. And uh, Jorn, what about you? I, I was actually going to say the BOC myself, but I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll flip that and I'll say uh, the BOE. But I, I think it'll be it'll, it, much later on in the year or Q1 next year, um, if if at all. Yeah. Well, that's going to be three votes for the Bank of Canada, because that's certainly where uh, I would have gone as well. Uh, with that uh, said and done, we're halfway through the show. So let's go on to the third round. So I really want to dig into some of the psychology behind the market here and, and use some of the phenomenal experience that we've got uh, on the panel. Obviously, Arno has been involved in the markets for some time, Ewan as well for a couple of decades. And, you know, I think Dick was here when they built most of the buildings in the city, <laughs> alone, uh, being involved in markets. 
Um, we've seen volatility across the board surge of late. That, that goes without saying. Since uh, Silicon Valley Bank kicked off, that feels like a hell of a long time ago now. And then, of course, further on the, the Credit Suisse issues last week. Um, just to put some numbers on it, and I've actually done my homework this week, which may surprise some viewers. Um, we've seen the Move Index, which Bank of America put together and it tracks volatility in the Treasury market. That's at its highest level since uh, 2008, 2009. The VIX is at its highest, or it's come off a little bit, but it was at its highest since the fourth quarter of last year. Same for um, a volatility index which tracks um, oil and options on oil, uh, and uh, an index put together by the CME which tracks a similar thing for gold is at its highest since last March. Um, Dick, I'm, I'm going to start with you, and, and apologies for my cheekiness just now. Um, what should traders be doing? How should they be adjusting and adapting to markets that are as choppy and uncertain as this, where things can just change at the at the drop of a hat? Uh, I'm going to answer it in two ways. One, I think the VIX is actually much too low. I don't think anyone is paying any attention to what's going on in Moscow. I think the meeting between Putin and Xi of China is a is a really dangerous um potential situation for the West. I think America is think Iran again will push Iran towards um, Russia and China. Uh, so I don't think there's any geopolitical risk involved in the markets. I also don't think there's any um, political risk attached to Sterling. I think Sunak has, has dug himself a hole uh, trying to resolve the problems in Ireland, and I think he could well get a shock on the vote on that. Uh, but fundamentally, I think the VIX is much, much too low. Uh, I'd be a buyer of the fix. And funnily enough, having mentioned China and Russia and whatever, and I'm not a gold bug, I'd probably be looking to buy gold. Uh, and apart from that, I'd just be day trading, scalping the markets. I don't think there's any huge direction. I think, funny enough, volatility in the FX markets is relatively low with, with range trading as far as I can see. So I'd, I'd just be scalping in and out during the day. But I, I am fundamentally a little bit worried about Russia and China. Yeah, it, it's interesting you mentioned the FX market. We're, we're going to come to that in a second because you're right, volatility there has been relatively low. Um, you know, and what are your thoughts on, you know, what should traders be doing if, if you're a, a retail trader, you know, relatively new, a couple of years in the market? How should you be adapting your style to, to what's going on right now? Well, I, I, I tend to look at, you know, some of the other indices as well. I, I wouldn't just primarily focus on the VIX. I mean, there are some of the old fashioned ones that we, where, where we went through the original uh, GFC, um, the, you know, the CDX investment grade index, you know, all of these indices that, you know, they're more pertinent to, to the issues at hand at the moment. So, you know, the eye tracks, these things are, are all back or should all be back in folk. And, you know, now, now we're start, starting to see, you know, their utility in hedging credit risk. Um, you know, you see, you're seeing their flexibility in alpha generating strategies as well. So you can use these tools, um, you know, as, as a guide on, on, you know, on how you position your trades or, you know, or what you get involved in. I mean, you know, everything, you know, everybody expects, you know, this, you know, the systematic CTA reversal that, that we've seen recently from short. You know, to, it's basically all the hedge funds starting to take risk off. Um, so, it's, so their their books now they're probably flat and they're looking for opportunity. So you said, like like Dick said, he's scalped in the market. I think what what will you what you do now, given that we've got that potential for headline risk going forward on the geopolitical front and the banking front, that you know you sh you should either be sitting on your hands and just trade it, trade in these outside moves. Um, or you, you know, you, you take a look at things like the, the CBOE S and P implied vol, um, implied correlation, excuse me, implied correlation index. Um, you know, just to see where, where, you know, people are, are positioning themselves in the options market. I mean, personally, I, I would just be trading outside moves and then, you know, looking at perhaps some downside protection, you know, th through, through puts. Um, so, so that's basically, you know, where, where I, where I would be, but I see like, you know, a lot of the capitulation that we've seen, you know, recently, um, it's because hedge funds were all short duration, uh, you know, position. So, 
we we sort of have a you know a clean slate now, and you, you can you can adjust your positions accordingly. But you have to be you know very very nimble, and you know the the opportunities are there, but you just have to you know be patient with them as well. No, I think that's some really really sage advice, and uh, as you said, importantly, don't have sort of tunnel vision and focus on one thing or, or one asset class or or one indicator, whatever it may be, um, and look at a whole suite of things to, to work out a full yeah, I mean, you can what's going on. So you can develop your own style from, from that, right? I mean, mm. you, we, I would go through and back test and you do everything in that manner. So you, you, see, you, know, you see an, an index um, and you try to put uh, – you know, tie it to performance of the, say, the S and P, and over time, you know, it's things like the, you know, the net liquidity or the Fed Fed liquidity, I mean, it started to tick up recently. I've tracked that on Fred, and it has a real, real high correlation with the S and P. So, you know, you take a long position as as it starts to tick up. And unfortunately, it's only a weekly uh, print, but. It's, but it's a good guide on you know how how the market continually chases liquidity. But if they, these there's a whole manner of these or a whole suite of these indices that, that you can use or uh, uh, that will get you know give you a decent guide on on you know on positioning and where, where the market will go. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is, as you said, Fred and a lot of other tools out there, uh, the CME website, TradingView, you know, a lot of this is is free to access. You don't need a, a Reuters or a Bloomberg terminal. Um, you know, you, you need a, an internet connection and maybe a bit of Excel knowledge and Bob's your uncle, away you go. Um, Arno, what, what are you, your thoughts, particularly on the FX market? As, as Dick said earlier, we haven't seen a massive surge in vol in, in G10 FX as we have in some other assets. What What's going to cause these ranges to break? Because it's not boring. We're seeing movement, but we're seeing support and resistance very, 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 very well respected. That's easy for me to say by and large. So what causes that dynamic to change? Well, I think, you know, just, just looking at the way that volatility has been tracking across major asset classes, I think the the bond market was a clear outlier. Right. So we are looking at the move index and it, it, I mean, it was a monumental move. But even though the VIX spiked up, you know, we, we, we didn't even get close to the highs that we saw throughout the bear market of 2022. So there wasn't a lot of there was stress, short term stress, but there wasn't this huge, you know, fear really coming into the equity space. Um, and then, you know, even more so when we talk about um, FX. So I think it's been mostly a, a, a case of. Um, like you and said, the market's positioning, you know, when, when all of that offside positioning got unwound very, very quickly, that ramped up bond volatility. But um, markets were fairly well positioned for downside in equities, for example, compared to, um, you know, upside in bonds. So I think a lot of the um, differences that we've seen in volatility between the bond market and the rest of, of uh, or the other asset classes has mainly been positioning uh, based as those trades, you know, just got, got whacked um, in a very short space of time. Um, I think something that can really invigorate this, and obviously this only comes out um, after we've had the FOMC, but I think the FOMC is a real clear risk uh, that could see FX as well as equity vol picking back up. Because at this stage, you know, if you take a look at what the markets are pricing in, we are just about pricing in a 25 basis point hike for, for tonight. And then we are pricing in cuts from about two months after that. So um, the biggest risk I think that could see uh, FX as well as equity vol jolting up is if the Fed comes out and even if they have a median that is slightly below the December level and a 2004 median that is you know very close to unchanged, that'll, I think, create a lot of volatility in this market because they won't, in my opinion, if they come out and they don't confirm what this, um, what Fed fund futures have been pricing in, that's going to be, that's going to be big risk. I mean, we've seen the markets flip-flopping from one extreme to the next over the last six weeks, this could be the catalyst that creates that initial, you know, pop to the upside in, in equities um, and obviously in the dollar as well. Um, so I think dollar yen is one to watch for that uh, on that front. If we do see the Fed coming out um, and they, you know, uh, um, if they don't confirm the market's view and they say, no, but we still we're slightly lower, but still for longer. Um, that's going to be a big difference between what the markets have already priced in for the Fed. And I think dollar yen Upside makes sense in that scenario because you would expect yields to recover a little bit after the moves we saw last week. 
And obviously, the dollar trading at the lows, you know, you would favor some upside risk as opposed to downside. Um, in terms of, you know, the broader, uh, just to latch on to what you and said, you know, something that I find quite helpful, unfortunately, it's not um, data that's, that's always freely available, but especially talking about the FX market, something that, you know, we do religiously is looking at the um, implied volatility numbers for FX pairs. So whether that is, um, you know, your one month, your one week, your overnight implied volatility, finding a range of what the options market is implying as a risk is a really, really good way of using a you know, a dynamic support resistance structure on your charts because um, as volatility increases, your range will increase. And as volatility decreases, your range will decrease. So that gives, you know, a trader a really good um, eyeball on where they should be limiting and defining their risk. And, you know, when you see that range pick up and expand as implied volatility increases, then obviously that means maybe come down on your leverage, maybe come down on your position size, make sure that you're widening those stops a little bit um, all of those things are, you know, it's tools that's that's super simple to use, but it's 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 very very useful if if uh, if used correctly. No, I think you're absolutely right. With that said and done, let's move on to the final round. Well, Dick, we're going to have to get you some points here, and I think we might have yeah. a perfect topic for you because we're ending the show today with uh, a clown show. No, sorry, we're going to talk about the Bank of England. Um, <laughs> consensus expects the old lady to raise rates by 25 basis points uh, tomorrow. Well, Thursday. We're recording this mid-morning Wednesday. So Thursday, uh, by the time you watch this, to four and a quarter percent, that would be where bank rate would then stand. Um, markets are now fully pricing that move after the inflation print we got out this morning. CPI at, what, 10.4%. I think it was in the month of February on a yearly basis, the core number at uh, 6.2%. So very, very worrying indeed there. Um, Dick, how are you viewing the Bank of England, not only in terms of the rate decision itself, but the vote split and also the guidance? Are we likely to see this as the last time the BOE hike this cycle? Uh, I'm going to go full Antonio Conte here. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go into a, a total rant about the Bank of England because they are absolutely shocking. And it's interesting that when um, Truss and Quartang went, that the adults were meant to be back in the room in terms of Sunak and Hunt. And Hunt's predicting that inflation is going to be 2.9% by the end of the year. You know, what planet's he on? There's absolutely no hope of that whatsoever. And meanwhile, the Bank of England eh, sort of dithers along what they should do and what they will do are two hugely different things. I think they shouldn't muck around. They should put um, base rate up by 1% tomorrow and just try and hit it on its head. They did it over the last, oh God knows, for ages and ages and ages about moving interest rates up. They won't do it. But, you know, I guess you put a gun to my head, they'll do a quarter of a percent. Um, to Renmo, to how you pronounce a bloody name, will probably want to cut. Um, I think you'll probably see a split of something like um, five four um, five in favour, two to hold rates, probably one to put one put it down and one to raise by fifty. I mean, it's an absolute excuse my language shit show. Uh, and what they do and what they should do, as I said earlier, two totally different things. Inflation is out of control. We all know that. I mean, I know we all get these phone calls or, or text messages or whatever. In the last month, my rail fare's gone up, my parking at the station's gone up, my broadband's gone up, um, it, it, you know, absolutely everything. My, my Sky television's gone up, so that's going to get cancelled. And inflation is endemic here, and it's getting out of control. And really, is it really 10.4%? I think it's near 15%. I look at my shopping, and I go, I can't believe how expensive this is coming. And it's going to get worse. I think agricultural products are going to go up in price. Farmers haven't planted potatoes this year. They've planted wheat, so there's going to be a potato shortage. You heard it here first, uh, which will put pressure on, on inflation. So quite honestly, what I'd really like to see them do is raise base rate by 1%. Bailey should get the sack because he's an absolute disgrace at the FCA. He never have got the job. He's a jumped-up civil servant. Uh, and then we can move on with, with the proper banker at the Bank of England. I will now shut up and go away <laughs> <laughs> and wait for the angry phone calls. <laughs> I was going to say, we'll, we'll give Dick a second to uh, simmer down there. And, and I, I, I would say don't cancel your Sky TV until you've seen Arsenal win the league at the very <laughs> least. Um, you and I want to come to you because you said something very interesting earlier about 
lags when it comes to monetary policy. Um, yeah. I think we've got an arch hawk on the panel this week over in Mayfair. Um, how are you seeing things? Do you think things are a little bit more nuanced with the bank? Uh, I, I like, I'm like, they, I have no confidence in the Bank of England. It's, they, they tend to disappear in between uh, rate meetings. Not, like, they should be doing a lot more to contain inflation, but they're not. Um, it just feels that they're, they're very reactionary. They're not proactive in anything that they do. Um, with regards to the day, uh, well, as we were saying, just to, to reiterate that point, it, it tends to be, you know, and, uh, the, well, according to the conventional wisdom, it's a nine to 12 month lag on the, um, you know, on the inflation front in reaction to, to interest rate moves. Um, now we can argue that, you know, they were, they were late, but they, they were late to, to start hiking, um, and then, of course, the the pandemic didn't help the situation at all. And I mean, they've they've just created this massive problem. Um, with regards to tomorrow, uh, everybody still thinks it'll be twenty five. Um, they probably have to do that now because if they don't do it, then they'll pro they're, they're conveying some sort of you know lack of confidence in in you know, the banking situation, especially with regards to the UBS and Credit Suisse. So, so you, I, they, they have to, in some shape or form, convey confidence in, in you know, the, the banking environment that they've basically over, overseen over the last few years. Um, so by, by raising by 25, they probably said, right, we're happy that, you know, everything in the banking sector is contained. Um, but going forward, um, you know, you're looking at uh, QT, it's, that's running smoothly. Um, you know, I think they're on course to, you know, to, sorry, just looking at the, the current holding, I think it was eight, just over 800 billion. So they, they, they're looking to cut that, you know, by 80 billion to, to around 750 billion this year. So that's on target. Um, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, you know, three month, uh, Sonia index future looks as if it's already topping out or about, you know, 4.9% around that area, um, for September. Um, so whether these hikes will now start to feed through the system, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm like there. I, I can see the, you know, the, the food price inflation, uh, issue getting worse before it gets better i've watched Parkinson's farm i know what the issues are um, so it's you know i i do think at some stage the, that economic activity will probably you know start to look like it'll grind to a halt and then they'll have to react in some shape or form but i do think that they've they've rushed really rushed to get ahead of themselves on the, on the rate hike front so that they can pause, assess the situation, and then it looks likely that the next moves will probably come down if it's not after, you know, the next hike or the, the hike after that. If it's a hike, then it, they, the next one will probably come back down. Yeah, because I think you're absolutely right there. Um, Arno, it's not usual that the UK has a higher inflation rate than South Africa. I mean, I guess the only saving grace is we have this marvellous thing called electricity uh, in yeah. our country, even though no one can actually afford it at this point. I'm, I'm um, awesome. <laughs> what are your thoughts for the BOE? And specifically, assuming you're on board with the fact that they're going to hike 25, where do you view the balance of risks for the pound? Yeah, I mean, you know, after inflation like today, we all know that they should be hiking rates. You know, that's, we know they should, whether they actually follow through with, with that is a, is a whole different story. I mean, uh, trying to pin down where the bank would go with the past, you know, two years from 2021, has just been a headache. You know, they've just done whatever they, they wanted to very much like the RBA as well. So I'm assuming we get a 25. Um, I think after inflation today, man will probably come in with another 50 basis point vote. Um, I don't think, that the inflation story will be enough for Dean Grant and Rero to to stop their um, their votes for a, for an unchanged. So I think we're going to have something very similar to to what we had with the prior uh, with the prior vote split. I don't see that really uh, changing too much. I mean, banking issues in the US and the EU hasn't really spilled over into the UK, so that should keep focus. I hope more on uh, inflation as opposed to you know the banking issues. We all know that that's what all the questions will be about tomorrow when it should be about other things, but. 
Um, I think we're going to get a hike. I think that should be supportive for Sterling. Um, a lot of that is already, you know, priced in, you know, after the CPI. So we just need to, you know, make sure that we, uh, that we keep track of that. But the one thing that I will be watching with a little bit more interest will be what they have to say about the growth profile, because we had the OBR coming out last week uh, with, uh, with the new budget, and they had a slightly more optimistic view about the growth profile for 2023. And if you take a look at a pair like Euro Sterling, um, the biggest reactions that we've seen over the last two months in Euro Sterling hasn't really been on the back of BOE interest rate expectations. It's been on the back of upside surprises in UK growth data or CPI data. So I think, you know, it's possible that we get the 25. That should be supportive for sterling. But I think if the growth profile can come in slightly better for 2023, I think that will be something that sterling might be more reactive to as opposed to just a as expected 25 basis point hike. Would the OBR ever be right about anything? <laughs> True. I was True. just about to say that. <laughs> <That's> any, any <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think the, the first rule with the OBR is they are always wrong about everything, no matter what it is. <laughs> it's um, the same with the IMF. The IMF, the, their, their economic projections, I, I used to call them the Institute, Institute of Moronic Forecasting. You see all the <laughs> 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 well, I think that is a brilliant line, a brilliant line on which to end the show. So let's have a look at the final scores on the doors. Well, I think, Dick, you're going to be adding, what is it now, a fourth wooden spoon? Uh, uh, oh, third. Sorry, uh, I've done you a disservice there. Um, and he's won his debut show. Ewan, congratulations. Well done, mate. <laughs> Wheels have won something. <laughs> 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 exactly. We will see uh, next week or the week after whether that was beginner's luck or whether we have struck gold with our new panellists. Uh, in any case, thank you to all the gents for joining me. Richard Matthews of Parlis FX, Arne Venter of Financial Source, and our winner, Ewan Smith, the market veteran from Wales. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you also to our producer, Kyriakos, for pulling this together so well as he always does. Uh, we will be back next week with another show. Uh, please leave a like, let us know in the comments what you think, how you're trading the markets and uh, we'll catch you again very soon. Thanks again. And goodbye for now.